If we pay attention, sometimes we can learn from serendipity. Suppose you're using your Superfly fly cutter, and instead of setting the feed rate to 1 inch per minute, you accidentally set it to 100 inches per minute. And then suppose the depth of cut is shallow enough that it doesn't crash and the Superfly can actually keep up with that, you'll end up with a weird swirly pattern on the top where it's overstepping instead of just cutting a nice even level surface. It swipes once, advances far enough that the next swipe is, sets up a pattern, sort of a gill-shaped pattern. Well, uh, that, that thought occurred to me. I didn't actually do that, but I think I saw where someone else accidentally did that. I started thinking about it. What, what would it be like? So I did a few experiments, and the first one didn't turn out very well. The turns out it's critically dependent on the, the uh, feed, the, how far you advance the feed and all, and the arc that you're cutting and the size of the material. But then I did it a second time, made some adjustments, and I got this kind of interesting looking pattern in a scrap chunk of PVC. This could be really useful if you wanted a visually interesting surface or you wanted a, a grippy surface or both. It actually turns out to be pretty good for that. So a good example would be something like the scales of a knife. You know, knife handles might want a surface like that. And it is two-dimensional, so you, know, you won't get a three-dimensional surface cut this way. You won't be like palm swells in a knife handle, for example. But for a lot of applications, this is maybe all you need. But then uh, I realized that the Superfly is really not, you know, the, the carbide insert is flat on the bottom. And that's really not the best, really not the best profile to be cutting. So uh, instead I've built this uh, Super Duper Fly. I've got another video on that. And I thought, well, what would happen if I cut just a piece of aluminum and deliberately did this sort of step and repeat pattern and tried it with the sharper tip on the fly cutter, the super fly, or the super duper fly, instead of this flat profile on the super fly. So I'll do that and we'll play around and see what, what kind of example we can get. I did also notice that Tormach had a, uh, I was calling this rapid machine uh, checkering. They call it, uh, in a recent newsletter of theirs, uh, flat knurling, which I guess is an equally descriptive uh, name for it. But anyway, I'll try it with the super duper fly that I made. And first I'll run it slowly to flatten it, and then I will uh, go back and do a step and repeat. And the first time across, it'll produce scalloped gill shaped pattern, you know, just little circular, semicircular cutouts. But the interesting thing happens when the backside catches it and it makes the pattern in the opposite direction. That's when you get this swirly diamond kind of interference pattern that arises. And again, this could be very useful if you, say, have a manual mill instead of a CNC mill and you want to get complex tool paths without CAD, CAM, CNC. You can uh, just do a quick step and you know, plun plunge, advance, plunge, advance. Very easy to do on a milling machine manually. Although CAD would be helpful for this because uh, a lot of this is trial and error I found out from my last experiments. And CAD can be very helpful in visualizing the interference pattern that arises. You can model that in CAD very quickly. But you can also do it just the way I do a lot of things. Just get down the shop and start playing around with it. So I'll be back, right back and we'll take a look at uh, whatever I get out of this. And that's the kind of uh, finish you'll get from just typical fly cutting. It's smooth. It's got a little scratch to it. My mill is a little out of trim, so I don't get a crosshatch pattern on mine. It just cuts on the leading edge and the trailing edge is not quite in the cut. So I'll never get that nice crosshatch pattern, which means on really large pieces it won't be completely flat. It'll be scalloped very slightly until I get around to trimming my mill again. But anyway... Let's go on and try and do a first and second pass. So we cut it with a leading edge, and then we'll cut it with a trailing edge. And then we'll see what that looks like. Uh, I have noticed in the past that this will be almost a linear cut. It's the diameter on this cutter is so large compared to the size of the workpiece. That ratio is important in trying to get a good crosshatch pattern. So what I expect to happen is 
uh, fairly subtle. You know, I won't have uh, I won't have a pattern where you can actually see a whole lot of curvature to the cuts. You can sort of see it in the finish here that these cuts are pretty good approximations of straight linear cuts. They're they're not, but because the radius of the cutter is so large, you'll end up with very gradual lines in here. It's not, you know, a sharp scallop line. So that'll drastically affect the the visual and the physical pattern you get for the grippiness. You can see that even on a manual mill, cranking the handles by hand, a pattern develops rather quickly. It doesn't take long to create this complex geometry without CAD, without CAM, without CNC, no G-coding, just cranking the handles. So you can see that we get these uh, strange fish gills. It's very grippy. That surface itself is actually pretty nice. You just wanted to have something flat, but also have something with a lot of texture. This would tumble nicely too and clean that up very well. It's, those are not really attached, those are just little pieces of swarf that are stuck down in there. But yeah, overall, that's a nice finish by itself. Uh, another thing I noticed before when I was doing this in the PVC with the Superfly is that I think it helps a lot to have the cutter engage and disengage at the same point. I'm off just slightly here, but it also helps to have the repeating pattern, you know, when I go to make the trailing edge cuts, it helps to have those uh, occur right in the, like a trough in a trough, if you will. That way you get uh, one of the, mo the more inter interesting interference patterns. So we'll, we'll shoot for that and see what happens. diamond sort of pattern that, that arises. Again, it's very grippy. A nice, nice feel to it. Also a nice, uh, nice look to it. A couple little boogers in there, but not too bad. Those come right out. That was a two tenths of an inch advance in the X direction and the leading and trailing edges coincident on the edge, more or less. Somewhat reminiscent of that pattern, but you can tell this is made with a smaller radius than this cut. A uh, fly cutter, you can adjust the radius, so you can make whatever you want. The profile on this, we look at the tool itself, it would be easier to see it on this, 60 degree included angle, but it's canted like 7 degrees back sweeping through for some rake, and it's also not normal to the surface as it's sweeping through, it's, it's canted back and also canted out, so it's, it's not a symmetrical pattern on there, it sort of has a handedness to it. Probably doesn't come across very much in the video here. It gives a little extra visual appeal. It's as if the cuts in both directions are sort of leaning in one direction. So it, even texturally, you can sort of feel that it's 
it's grippier in one direction than another, which might be nice if it was a knife and you didn't want it pulling out of your hand, you'd orient it so that it, the grippiness worked to keep it in your hand. But it would also be possible to make a bar with a simple little carbide cutter that was, instead of that uh, kind of included angle, it's more like a straight, uh, sharp point, a really small, maybe don't go as deep. Might try that and see what happens. But uh, maybe those, you don't want much of an angle on there. You just want straight cuts in. Or you do want that 60 degree angle, but you want it much shallower. So it's more just like uh, a line rather than a wedge cut out of it. You, know, you can control that with the depth of cut and also with the profile of the cutter. Also, some of these carbide tools are sharper on the ends than others. You know, the sharper ones cut finer, but they also wear faster. So you might want to select a carbide insert that has a 64th of an inch radius, some small radius on the end. But anyway, I thought, uh, thought you might find that interesting. And I recommended this as a way of getting complex geometries without using CNC. But of course, if you had CNC at your disposal, this would be a very fast way to produce complex geometries rather than taking the time to run a cutter, small diameter cutter, and mill all these. You can just take a large diameter cutter and whack once advanced. So it'd be real simple G-code, and you could very quickly with CNC crank these out. Just chuck it up, press start, come back, in a minute it's done. So hopefully you can add that to your box of tools. It's always good to have more tools in your toolbox. Catch you on the next video. Bonus round. Did something a little different. This time I offset the center of cut two tenths of, of an inch in Y this direction, leading edge, and then two tenths in Y the other direction, leading edge. So both of these cuts are leading edge cuts. So both of the scallops are in the same direction, just offset a bit. And also went, uh, instead of 20, uh, about 20,000th depth, I went 10,000th depth. I like that. It's a little better. It's not quite as quite as aggressive. It's still plenty grippy, but it's not quite that heavy texture of this. You know, that could be good on a really large object. For a smaller object, that's probably more appropriate. I got one more thing to try. I'm going to try doing a two tenths offset each direction, but then use the leading edge and then the trailing edge and see what that looks like. Well, that turned out a lot like the last one, except the arcs are going different directions, but Still, yeah, it's an experimental process. That doesn't float my boat too much. I think I'll go for a little more texture. What happens if instead of going in X, you move in Y? You get this interference pattern. And I like the pineapple looking stuff up in here, down in there better than these uh, gradual swoopy things in here. So if you wanted more of that, what you would do is for a, this is a six inch cutter and a one and a half inch wide part. You would uh, you would get a maybe a two inch wide cutter for a one and a half inch wide part, so that diameter is more like this. So you need more of tight interference pattern. But anyway, play around with it, see what you like, and this time I really will see you next time.